join us for the follow-up discussion on the topic of immigration and the financial aspects one need to consider as part of the process when one decides to move and live abroad. Now, during our first immigration webinar on the 29th of July, we covered aspects such as the meaning of the term financial immigration, the implications of ceasing to be a tax resident, tax implications for expatriates, estate planning and investment and retirement planning. Now, subsequent to our previous webinar, various legislative changes have been proposed that may affect your planning, particularly in respect of withdrawals from retirement funds. Now, this webinar aims to keep you informed about how the impending relaxation of exchange control may affect the withdrawal of certain retirement funds. And it is for this reason that we thought it would be a good idea to bring our clients up to speed on the proposed amendments in the 2020 budget speech, the proposed amendments to the Tax Act, the treatment of pension or provident funds, retirement annuities, as well as pension preservation and provident preservation funds, and also disinvestments from retirement funds on relocation for individuals under, as well as over the age of 55 years and their respective options. Now, joining us once again today to help us unpack these latest legislative developments is the highly experienced team of financial specialists that participated in our first immigration webinar. And uh, given that it's ladies first, we'll start with Sarah Simpson, who is our head of fiduciary services at Sassman Wealth and who specialize in assisting individuals and families in structuring their estates in the most effective way possible when it comes to the intergenerational transfer of wealth. Welcome again to today's discussion, Sarah. Thank you, Johan, and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, yes, and then once again, we are privileged to have Andrew Wellstead with us, um, who is an international tax specialist and a director of CMSR in Partners. Andrew is a highly regarded tax practitioner and is a lawyer by training. He specializes in tax and transactional structuring solutions and has significant tax litigation experience and has excellent relationships with numerous South African regulators. He has also written numerous articles and has been included in several international lawyers' publications. Welcome back again, Andrew. And also, once again, from the beautiful Eastern Cape, I'd like to introduce uh, Gavin Kane, who is a senior wealth advisor at Sassman Wealth with many years of financial planning experience. Welcome again to you too, Gavin. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to be with you all. So, Sarah, yes, back to you. Um, before we get into the detail of the, today's discussion, I would like to ask you to please provide us with a brief recap uh, on some of the basic concepts around immigration for the benefit of those who did and maybe also those who did not attend our last session in July. Sure, Johan, thank you. So we do want to lay some basic foundations as to what we are going to get into a little bit more today. So the things that we do want to consider is how is tax residency created? And we did discuss this quite a bit. So we're going to delve into this very, very briefly. Looking at the three ways that tax residency is created, one can be ordinarily resident. So this means where are my slippers? Where do I return to from my wanderings? Now, because this is a subjective state of mind, it's not something that other people are privy to. So this also needs to be accompanied by facts that evidence this, because only you know your subject of intention. The second way in which you can be tax resident is in terms of a physical presence test. So this is just looking at your days onshore. Um, basic rule of thumb, looking at 91 days for every six years, 915 days in a rolling period of five years, plus one um, full year of 91, um, 91 days in the sixth year. So these are just basic rules of thumb. And this looks at my feet being in the border. I spend some time here. I can actually count my days. It's something that should be relatively easy for you to determine. And lastly, we're looking at when you are deemed to be exclusively a tax resident in terms of a double tax agreement. So this would mean that you have more ties to one jurisdiction in terms of a double tax agreement. And as a result of that, you become a tax resident and therefore you are no longer a tax resident in a different jurisdiction. So these are the three ways in which you would become a tax resident and be a better African law. 
So now we also just want to recap on the last session where we discussed how do I cease that tax residency? So if I were to cease my ordinarily tax resident status, how do I do that? We did say that that is a subjective state of mind. So how do I show that? It would be evidenced by certain facts. I buy a plane ticket, I climb on a plane, I sell my assets. So this does have to be accompanied by facts that show that you have ceased your ordinary, ordinary tax resident status. Now, this could potentially be difficult if you're heading to a jurisdiction where you have a temporary visa, because you would have to show that you were able to stay there long enough to be giving up your ordinary tax status, and your burden of proof may be slightly more difficult. Looking at your physical presence test, you would want to make sure that you're not in South Africa for more than 91 days per year. General rule of thumb. Now, this is not an option that is available to somebody who is ordinarily resident. So if you live in Bryanston and you travel to Singapore a lot and you're out the country, do not even attempt to try and count your days to say that you're not physically present. This test is not applicable to you. And then thirdly, we can look at becoming solely a tax resident in terms of a double tax agreement. I don't want to delve too much into double tax agreements because those are beyond the ambit of today's discussion. But typically, where I move to Mauritius, I buy a house, I get a club membership, these are actions that show that I'm entrenching myself in that tax jurisdiction. And that would mean that you could potentially become solely a tax resident in terms of a double tax agreement. So now we are left with an understanding that financial immigrate does not mean that you've relinquished your tax residency. For example, you may very well immigrate, but you come back to look after um, sick parents, or maybe you've got children and grandchildren in South Africa. And by doing so, you may have unwittingly triggered a physical presence test. It's also very important to note that you can be ordinarily tax resident in South Africa and also physically tax um, pres present in another jurisdiction. So looking at other jurisdictions, they also have days counting tests. Every country is trying to assert that you are its tax resident merely by the presence that you are spending in its country. It's not just South Africa. So having a look at your physical presence test and being ordinarily tax resident, this is an instance where a double tax agreement typically would be something that you would have to rely on without going into much further detail. So I think Johan, this really serves as a background to highlight how important it is to distinguish between immigration, which the, the um, term is used financial immigration, which is really an exchange control process versus the cessation of tax residency, which is a SARS process. And one does not necessarily require the other. So we wanna look at the actual connection between the two concepts. Immigration is factual evidence that one has created their tax residency, and typically one would consider having to do this if one had a substantial presence in more than one jurisdiction. So I have so much entrenchment in two jurisdictions that I now want to show that I'm more entrenched in one than the other. The moment you are very clearly connected to one jurisdiction more than another, you probably have become solely a tax resident in that jurisdiction in terms of a double tax agreement, if in fact there really was one. So to all the people that climb on a plane without immigrating, hoping never to trigger what is called exit tax, your deemed capital gains tax, at some point you may very well have triggered your obligation to pay exit tax without even knowing it. Immigration to date has really provided both clients and SARS with more clarity as to people's tax status because it's really used as evidence of cessation of an ordinary tax resident status. It's not usually considered prejudicial. And it can be advantageous in some circumstances. For instance, merely changing your tax status will leave you subject to exchange control regulations. And immigration in the past has been an option to those who may have been negatively affected by this. So in highlighting the distinction, we are really left with questions why one would want to financially immigrate, where there could be even a, an automatic computation of your tax status. And in actual fact, this doesn't always cast your tax fate in stone. So why would you want to do it? Now, one of the leading factors or motivations or incentives, if you will, for those who financially immigrate has always been this instant access to a pool of retirement funds. So this would be the key to unlock the kitty that they may need to access for their new lives, um, funding for the new destination. Now, some clients don't need that funding, but they have fears regarding political volatility. And they just want to make sure that their funds are exposed to offshore opportunities that may be limited in terms of legislation or to ensure that they're not building up 
the foreign currency denominated cost of living whilst their current investments are depreciating. So really, Johan, it is against this backdrop that we see the options that we have had to date that are going to be minimized. And to understand that the planning will be based on tax structuring. And we need to understand what this means to people wanting to access their retirement funds. Over to you, Johan. Sarah, thank you very much for that recap. I see there are some questions coming through on the chats there, so it will be great if you can also start uh, paying some attention to some of those that's come in. But, um, Andrew, I would like to now move across to you and explore the issues around what is a residence are allowed to do and also what they're not allowed to do, given the current exchange control regime in South Africa. But... Please, can you start by briefly highlighting the key aspects to take note of around the immigration process and implications from a tax and exchange control perspective for individuals? And also, please just clarify for us where the concept of financial immigration comes into all of this. Sure, with pleasure. So just to recap, my theme is always going to be it's normally simple. And what do I mean by that? I mean, most of the cases that we come up with are simple. People are leaving the country, they're immigrating, um, they're doing it for reasons other than tax. And so the the tax implications and the exchange control implications are a byproduct and they're easily explained. All of the complexity, counting days, things like that, it can come up in the fringe cases and you'll know quite quickly if you're a fringe case. But let's just go through it. There's tax immigration, and, and Sarah very elegantly summarized it all. M most of us are ordinarily resident because we've been living here a long time. If you've been living in the country for your life or many years, you can assume you're ordinarily resident from a tax perspective. That means that you're going to cease to be tax resident in South Africa if you emigrate. Emigrate means go and live somewhere else. I'll come back to what, what else could you be doing if you're saying you're emigrating just now. So you can live somewhere else. You have to do a final tax return where you pay what we call an exit tax, which is a deemed CGT on certain of your assets. Just to be clear, it's not immovable property in South Africa because that stays within the tax. But it's things like shares, okay? So you pay a you pay a, a deemed CGT charge on certain of your capital assets, and you will see in the return. The return these days asks you, did you cease to be resident? And you'll click yes. That really will be 80% of the work you need to do to immigrate from a tax perspective. From an exchange control perspective, you need to get in touch with your bank and you need to do what we call a form MP336. And the bank tells you what information you need. They spoon feed you. And that is the way to complete the exchange control immigration process. So where does that leave financial immigration? Financial immigration is a bit of a catchphrase that developed in recent years. And I think Sarah said it, it relates mostly to ceasing to be exchange control resident because the, the, the perception is that once you're not exchange control resident, you can freely move your assets. And that may or may not be true depending on what they are. But financial immigration for me is a bit of a misnomer. The, most of the cases that I come across, somebody has decided they're going to live somewhere else permanently, okay? Um, it's very easy then to determine whether they're going to be exchange control and tax resident and to guide them through the process. The only difficulty is for some people, the concept of financial immigration has created the perception that maybe it's elective. Maybe I can choose to emigrate and maybe I can what I call semigrate. Semigrate used to be going just from Joburg to Cape Town, but now it's actually a little bit broader than that. People are doing it. They, they intend to spend some time elsewhere in the world, maybe get another um, a, a visa or um, permanent residence somewhere else, but they're going to spend a substantial time in South Africa still. And it's those people where the complexity come in. People open my door and they say, it's fine. I'm going to be 183 days. I say, please erase what you think you know. Tell me what you're going to be doing. As I say, the bulk of cases, people are immigrating and it's very easy to follow. But... Um, it's the cases where people are working abroad and would prefer not to be tax residents in South Africa, but still have uh, very close ties to South Africa, both financially and from a sort of family and social perspective, or where they think they can immigrate from a 
an elective perspective that the problems come in. Thank you. Um, just maybe something to follow on from that. Uh, do I need to be a tax resident somewhere else before I cease being tax resident in South Africa? Or must I have citizenship um, or another right maybe in another jurisdiction before I can cease to be the resident in South Africa? So that's a great question and it's something that's coming up a lot now. Um, remember, when you, when you cease to be ordinarily resident, which as Sarah said is an, an intention test relating to where you regard as your home, it's very difficult to sustain a narrative where you say, I regard somewhere else as my home but I actually don't have the right to live there permanently. So let me give you a great example. And, and I'm not, a, I'm not a, a visa or immigration lawyer. So if I get this wrong, please excuse me. But my understanding is that in Dubai, uh, non-citizens of Dubai normally get a two year rolling working visa. It means that it has to be, it has to be re um, renewed every two years or maybe a longer period, but sort of maybe max five, okay? In other words, you don't have a permanent right to live in Dubai. If your employment terminated or something happened, that, that visa can be ended. If you got to the end of the term and you didn't have any further job, you'd have to come home. Now, that gives you the answer right there. Where is home? That's the place where you can at least reside permanently. So one of the factors, and remember, this is a holistic test. We're asking, where do your family live? Where are your business interests? Blah, blah, blah. One of the questions that could and should be asked is not where are you going to be tax resident when you leave? Our test of tax residents doesn't say, it doesn't have a component of ascertaining whether you tax resident somewhere else. It's got its rules around South Africa. But if you don't have an entitlement to live permanently somewhere else, I think logically and pretty uncontroversially, you can't claim that you're immigrating because if something goes wrong, you're going to have to come home. So it really is a key component, but our test, strictly speaking, as I say, doesn't say you must be tax resident somewhere else. It looks at the South African test. And, and then there are a range of other factors that they will look at, but it has come to our attention that a lot of people believe they've immigrated. And when you go into their residency status in another jurisdiction, it's actually very weak. And I think that could undermine you in a number of cases. Okay. Now, Andrew, last time we spoke uh, a lot about relaxations of exchange control, but we haven't seen anything concrete in this regard yet. Uh, is it still happening as there are currently some rumors in the market which suggest that it may not happen? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question because it, it was announced in very strong terms in the budget that exchange control was going to be removed. Okay. Now, it didn't say removed entirely. They were changing the system. And the new system, there would still be some checks and balances, but it was moving to what they call a negative system where there's certain things you can't do and there's going to be a small list. But the key difference, if you read the budget, was the concept of exchange control residency was going to be dropped. So the, 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 the distinction between an exchange control non-resident and a resident was going to fall away. And the approval process was largely going to fall away. So we have eagerly been waiting for the details of this because obviously the devil will be in the detail as is always the case. Now, nothing further has been released substantial. And there are those people in the market who suggest that perhaps the minister's policy wishes ran ahead of what's practical or um, possibly there wasn't enough consultation within treasury itself. But nothing suggests, nothing formal suggests that the process of removing exchange controls will be abandoned. And I think the upcoming week or so is going to be very important for the country. We've got the president speaking on Thursday about the economic recovery plans. And then um, the, minister, the Minister of Finance is due to do the mini budget on the 21st. I believe he has asked for it to be extended to the 28th. But those are going to be really, really important events in the, in the fiscal history of this country. Because how are we going to dig ourselves out of the damage done by corona should be laid bare. And then things like whether or not the removal of exchange control has been um, rethought, or if it is going ahead, 
should hopefully at least be confirmed or um, some, some update should be provided. But all, all indications are the last um, official position is that it is happening. It hasn't happened as quickly as we thought it might. And I think Corona probably bears uh, some of the blame for that. Um, but I'm really hopeful that we get some clarity between the president's talk and the mini budget. As you say, you know, the fiscal situation and all of these matters uh, go hand in hand. And as you said, the devil will be in the details. So people must um, really just make sure that they um, kind of like uh, get to know what is being said uh, at those events um, coming up. Um, but Andrew, it's a, a longish question, maybe just to lead into the question, you know, just, uh, you know in, in accordance with the policy decision to phase out financial immigration for exchange control purposes, which was now announced in the 2020 budget speech, National Treasury and the South African Revenue Services have proposed to amend the definitions of the terms pension preservation fund, provident preservation fund, and also retirement annuity fund. Now, in addition to that, it seems that the proposals in the tax draft or draft tax bill relates to the ability of people immigrating from South Africa to withdraw amounts from their pension preservation, provident preservation, or their retirement annuity. And in this regard, the changes proposed to the pension rules for tax seems to confirm your view. Can you explain the change and what our clients need to do in this regard? Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're exactly right, Johan. The, the one real bit of reinforcement that came from Treasury, because remember both, um, to, to some extent, the minister is in charge uh, of, of both exchange control and tax. Somewhere along the line, he, he has a hand in both. Now, the Taxation Laws Amendment Bill, which has just been, uh, the updated version has been released, as you correctly say, has a rule regarding pension funds, which I'll talk to you about now. And when you read the explanatory memorandum, it's quite clear that this new rule is being introduced in anticipation of exchange controls being um, withdrawn or, or severely um, pruned, as was announced in the budget. So to me, the naysayers in the market who say, well, the government can't afford to get rid of exchange control, et cetera, I'm not saying that's conclusive of the fact, but it is a very, very strong indication that certainly within Treasury, the intention is to um, reduce exchange control substantially. And this is this is as good evidence as you need um, that they're going ahead with it. And the tax change that you're referring to is that effectively for pension funds now, in order to be able to withdraw your pension fund, you will have to cease to be tax resident for a period of three years. Now, um, the rule previously was that if you if you emigrated for exchange control purposes, so-called financial immigration, then you could access your pension funds. Now, when um, when exchange control immigration ceases because they withdraw it, there's going to be a gap or a lacuna in the tax legislation. So the the new rule that has been introduced is that you'll have to cease to be tax resident for three years. You'll have to do a return your exit return, pay your exit tax, and then you'll have to wait three years before you can access your pension funds. Andrew, is just a final question maybe before um, I move over to Gavin. Um, it is always interesting when one starts considering the unintended consequences of legislative changes. Now, what are some of the potential challenges that the implementation of the legislative changes we discussed could pose? for government and or our clients? And um, has this been considered? Yeah, look, I mean, there, there has been, a, there has been a, a, a consultation process and the documentation came out yesterday. Um, so, so the way that the tax legislation works is the first draft is released. There's a consultative process. So it's quite clear that it has been thought through quite carefully. And, you know, there, there were some, there were some uh, comments made that the current... Um, version, the three-year tax uh, immigration rule was problematic, but as far as I can tell, that's been rejected and they stuck with that. But for for example, uh, some of the unintended consequences would be for people who are in the process in front of Saab doing their financial immigration or ceasing to be exchange control resident. What about them? Where are they left? And it looks like they've acknowledged that 
um, you know, prior to, I think it's March 2021, if you get your affairs in order before then, you will still fall back on the old rule, i.e. exchange control immigration will allow you to access your pension funds. So there are a number of unintended consequences. They do seem to have thought through the process. It is in line with what was announced in the budget on exchange control. And I think there were some fairly good uh, comments uh, made in the consultation process. And I, I quite like their responses. So I think that they are being um, even-handed about it. And I, I personally am of the view that the removal of exchange control will benefit us all from a number of perspectives. Um, so I think that the tax change is sensible and defensible and will be implemented sensibly. Thanks, Andrew. I might come back to you a bit later again. But uh, Gavin, I would now want to explore with you some of the financial planning aspects when it comes to financial immigration as it relates to the latest legislative developments. Can you maybe take us through the current status in respect of withdrawing one's retirement annuity or your pension or provident preservation fund? Okay, so it's important to understand that there are a couple of um, there are a couple of um, versions of retirement funds. So when you talk about retirement funds, there are you could belong to one of three funds. You could belong to a provident fund, you could belong to a pension fund, or you could belong to a retirement annuity. And each of those has different consequences. So let's forget emigration for the moment. You can always take your lump sum from a provident fund. So that isn't affected by emigration. So if you were planning to emigrate, you would simply resign from your employer and withdraw from the provident fund, and you'd be able to take the entire amount as a taxable lump sum. The pension fund, you can do the same if you withdraw. You can withdraw from your pension fund and take the entire amount as a lump sum. When it comes to retirement annuities, that it has always been that you may only take, on retirement, you may only take one third of your fund in cash and the balance, you're compelled to buy a pension with that. Now, it's the retirement annuities that are affected mainly by these immigration provisions, given that you can always get your lump sums out of pension funds, always get your lump sums out of provident funds. Retirement annuities, there are, there are a couple of exceptions where you can get a lump sum out. One of them is if the retirement annuity is, is too small to administer. And the second one is, and this is prior to retirement, you can get a lump sum out on emigration. Now, the reason for, the, the reason for these measures at, on emigration was to create a, a certainty that you were in fact not using this as an excuse to get your capital out of your retirement annuity. So for example, um, if, if you were to approach your employer, I beg your pardon, if you were to approach the administrator of your retirement annuity and say, I want a lump sum because I'm, I'm in dire straits, the, the retirement fund has no discretion. They have to say no, you can't have the lump sum. So you could say, but I'm emigrating and the administrator would say, well, what proof do you have that you're immigrating? And the proof used to be, or, and still is for the, for the moment, the so-called financial immigration, finalizing of your last tax return, um, paying your CGT on exit, and that would give an evidence to the administrator that you were, gonna, you were allowed to take your retirement annuity as a lump sum. If that goes away, there has to be another measure to say, how can you now prove to the administrator that you are in fact emigrating and not just finding an excuse to take your lump sum out of your RA? And the, what they've now decided on is the, the three-year threshold. So um, you now have to be able to convince the administrator of your retirement annuity that you have, been, you have emigrated for three years. So what is not clear is whether whether it's three years from the 1st of March next year or a total of three years. But you have to be able to prove to the administrator that, you've, that you have been out of South Africa, i.e. emigrated, for more than three years. So that's where we are right now. Um, if you've already retired and are living off an annuity, that annuity cannot be commuted to a lump sum, uh, and it's always been the case. 
that will remain to be administered in South Africa and will be uh, able to be passed overseas um, subject to what's left of exchange controls. Great. I think you've just answered one of the questions there on the chat. Um, but Gavin, how do these withdrawals differ from withdrawals from pension funds and provident funds upon immigration? Well, presumably what you would do if you've emigrated, if you are planning on emigrating or, or have made, formed an opinion to emigrate, is that you would withdraw from your pension or provident fund in the ordinary course, the way, the way you would withdraw from it, even if you stayed in South Africa and changed employers. You would resign from your employer um, and withdraw from your pension or provident fund. Uh, and that, and that's the, the, the tax and all, other cons- uh, and all other considerations remain the same. Yeah. Yeah. And again, you touched on it, but can you maybe just take us through the anticipated changes to the current status and how this would affect clients that have retirement annuities or pension provident uh, preservation funds? Okay, so the, uh, the change, the three-year change will, will affect retirement annuities and perhaps pension and provident funds, that's not clear yet, when you've preserved them. In other words, you've left your employer and you've elected to preserve your pension or provident fund. Um, ordinarily, you're allowed one withdrawal, but if you've already exercised that right of one withdrawal, will you be able to make another withdrawal, presumably for the whole amount, in the event of your emigration? So the new three-year rule from the 1st of March says that you have to, in order to get your retirement annuity or your pension or provident with uh, preservation fund paid to you as a lump sum, you will have to prove that you've been, that you have emigrated and have been overseas or outside of South Africa for longer than three years. So that's the, ma- that's the major change. The, the previous situation was that you had to have the letters of financial emigration uh, which presumably would be a shortened lead time, but also strong evidence that you had in fact emigrated. But if exchange controls are relaxed or disappear, that fiscal or f- financial el- um, emigration isn't going to happen anymore. Okay, so yes, as you say, you know, still a lot of detail to come through, but let's just look at a specific scenario, Gavin, where uh, somebody... Um, who's over 55 and wishes to emigrate, if they have not withdrawn from the RA or Pension or Provident Preservation Fund. Um, also, how, how do most retirement fund companies respond to such requests? Okay, so that's a very important question because you have, at over 55, you have two choices. You could withdraw from your retirement fund or you could retire. Now, what the what the, the law requires is that you, in order to get the lump sum out, you have to withdraw. Now, the fact that you can retire, does that, to use a terrible expression, does that trump your right to withdraw? And in practice, most of the administrators will allow you to choose at the age of 50, uh, uh, older than 55, whether you're in fact retiring or withdrawing. It's important to get good advice because this this part of the the um, transactions relies a lot on, on an understanding of what the administrators will do, filling in the correct forms. Um, for example, having indicated that you want to retire and then changing your mind and trying to go back and withdraw may not be allowed by the administrator. So you would need to get good, solid advice about um, what you should be doing and then how, what the process will be to, to correctly implement that decision. And then my last question to you, Gavin, um, what would be the situation in terms of accessibility if a client had commuted their retirement annuity into a living annuity and they wanted to immigrate? Okay, as I said earlier, a living annuity, and in fact, any annuity is in fact a contract for an annuity or a pension. Those contracts cannot be reversed. So although you can invest the underlying assets in a living annuity, 100% offshore, it would have to remain to be administered in South Africa and the funds remitted across to you uh, via whatever's left of the exchange control regulations. Thanks, Gavin.
I'll leave you to uh, answer maybe some of the other questions on the chat. Uh, Andrew, I briefly want to come back to you. You know, the three-year delay in releasing retirement uh, savings for someone who emigrates that Gavin mentioned may cause a knee-jerk reaction to those wishing to relocate. So what would your advice be to someone who is wondering, should I now rush my immigration in case there are new taxes introduced in the budget in February? Yeah, it's good. And you can see some of the questions on the Q&A and the chat are alluding to that. Look, an immigration plan is something that uh, needs to be undertaken carefully. It's, it's not only something that you do for fiscal reasons. It has massive lifestyle implications, family, etc. So it depends. I chatted to a guy who is immigrating regardless. They had earmarked June, okay? Um, but whether they go in June or January doesn't matter. And, you know, the question of whether or not you want to access your pension, there's a lot of other noise. You may have seen the article yesterday about the Presidential Advisory Committee talking about wealth taxes. Um, I think they called it a solidarity tax or something like that. But there's quite a lot of noise in the market. And one of the – immigration does solve some of these problems, Okay. You may feel you're better off um, if you if you immigrate for exchange control purposes rather than waiting three years. Um, you may also feel you're better off leaving before uh, any tax laws are enacted. You know, assuming that they'll be delayed till February. Who knows what can happen in the post-COVID world? Um, but making a lifestyle decision based on a fiscal aspect only is is dangerous. Okay. So, as I say, it depends on the facts. The chap who had his ducks lined up and not, not much mattered whether it was January or June, I could say to him, well, you're going anyway, nothing turns on it, do it. Um, I certainly wouldn't suggest to somebody who hadn't um, thought through all of the issues very comprehensively to do something on a knee-jerk basis because they perceive they're going to improve their fiscal position in relation to their pension or some other tax outcome. Um, I think that an immigration is a big move, uh, both for you and your family, and all of the implications of it need to be thought through very carefully. Um, Andrew and, and Sarah as well, um, you know, usually when there's uh, legislative changes from a tax perspective, you know, then people get very worried and it sounds like it can always be only be bad news. But do you see any potential positive outcomes to this potential amendment? Um, look, to me, I'll, I'll let Sarah jump in now. Uh, to me, it's just, I mean, the, the very positive thing, and I think I said it just now, to me, the positive thing is the amendment comes in anticipation of the removal of exchange control. And, and I'm not a big fan of exchange controls for a range of reasons. So um, to me, this particular rule um, exists to draw a line in the sand as to when you can access your pension. Again, you know, a lot of people have left the country and immigrated in the, in the layperson's understanding of the term and maybe for tax, but a lot of them left exchange control anyway. Um, only the very few Parat people who were carefully um, planning their affairs moved quickly so they could access their pension funds, although it was, it was frequently done, to be fair. So, so to me... I think the, the, the most positive thing is the, the reason behind it is the removal of exchange control, which shows commitment to the announcement in the budget. And I think that's the right move for the economy. Can I just spend one minute on why I think it is? Because a lot of people say, look, if you take exchange control, the gates are going to open. Okay, Capital is going to leave. The capital is leaving now. Okay, People have been able to move 11 million per person for quite a long time. And there are only a very, very few who 11 million per annum per person is not enough. So the capital has been going and rest assured, there are ways to make it go even under the current exchange control regime. And where somebody's got a spare 10 million, he's definitely going to make it go. There's no doubt about it. He's got 10 million. He's allowed to take it out. There's no question. Who knows what the rules will be tomorrow? That 10 million must go. If, we, if exchange control is going to be in place, he doesn't have the urgency to remove the 10 million now unless he's got a more attractive opportunity overseas because he can, knows he can do it 
next week, next year, whatever he wants. That's good. It may have a counterintuitive slowdown on the export of capital. The second thing is, once we can choose where our capital sits, it forces the country to become more competitive from a financial perspective. Okay, Regardless of exchange control, if, the, if, the, if you're not getting a return on your investment and you're getting overtaxed, people are going to take their capital out. If we remove exchange controls, hopefully it's going to force the country to rethink our economic um, dilemma that we're in and to really start, start making the country an attractive place to leave your money because that's going to help the economy and that's really what's going to help us get out of the COVID, not greater taxes. Correct, yeah. I mean, you know, putting uh, controls in place is always the worst case uh, scenario. Sarah, any thoughts from your side? Sorry, yes, Johan. So a little bit of a light of a ton um, at the end of the tunnel for those who did not financially immigrate and who've spent quite a bit of time offshore without being able to access those retirement annuities and preservation funds. In all likelihood, falling into the new legislation, um, it may be that they would be able to access retirement funds that they weren't able to previously. And that was a question on the chat as well. Great, thanks. So I see the chat has been pretty active, and I also see that the link uh, to the first session has been uh, posted in the chat, so um, you can always just go through there and copy that link, maybe. Um, Sarah, I don't know if you've been watching the chat, and if there's anything else that you've seen that's come up that's of specific interest and that still needs to be addressed here? So I think just really one point, people um, were of the understanding that if you are over the age of 55, that potentially it's the, the option to withdraw is no longer open to you. And whilst this may be the case with certain funds, this is actually dependent on the funds. Some of them would allow you, if you haven't made any previous withdrawals and you are over the age of 55, the practice is with some of them even still allow you to do allow you to withdraw on immigration. And that's pretty certain much something that we don't know um, what's going to happen with that change and how it's going to affect this position. So it leaves us with a big question mark. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think that if I look at the, the chats here, it seems like most of these questions have been answered, but we'll continue to answer them and, and, and get uh, back to the um, guests that have been asking the questions. And we'll also, again, uh, be hopefully following this discussion up with an article that pretty much summarizes um, the, the, the most pertinent points that's come out of today's uh, discussion. So I don't know, maybe just the uh, last round in terms of any final comments, um, Andrew, just starting with you before we close out. Yeah, um, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reiterate what I said last time. Um, immigrating in the bulk of the cases is not that complicated. There's two processes that need to be followed. There's the tax and the exchange control currently. To a large extent, the exchange control should resolve itself uh, if it is withdrawn, as we've said several times, is the stated policy because um, the concept of a resident will be withdrawn. So there are a number of people who that'll be very beneficial for because it'll solve something that they hadn't formalized as yet. The important thing is don't panic. Um, most people are going to fall into that that peak on the uh, on the curve, and so immigrating is easy, as I say. If you are immigrating for fiscal reasons only, then do take advice. Um, you know, you can get yourself into a load of trouble by getting a short-term outcome that that is later um, shown to be incorrect factually. And you know, lockdown things like lockdown and the bar on international travel, um, those are something that. If you open any case law, it doesn't refer to it. it. never happened before. But that could be a factor that tax authorities take account of. So I always say to people, rather make your life choices uh, based on how you want to live and what you want your lifestyle to be, and then make your tax affairs follow that. There is a lot of panic and concern in South Africa at the moment, and I'm not saying it's unfounded, but I don't think hasty, unplanned actions are the way to respond to it. Um, I think carefully thinking through the outcomes of what you're doing, making sure it matches and seeking the right advice will make the process of deciding whether to immigrate 
and then immigrating, if you're doing it correctly, much simpler. Absolutely. And I, I agree with you so much in terms of the fact that you shouldn't panic. You know, something that's related to this topic is this whole issue of prescribed assets, where a lot of retirement fund members and trustees have been worried about, you know, government forcing retirement funds to invest in state-owned enterprises, etc. But you have to then clearly go and look at what's the facts. And right now, there is nothing really to, 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 to panic about. And one just have to keep your finger on the pulse. And as you said, you know, you've got to get the right advice. And, uh, you know, to save yourself a lot of money down the line, you know, paying a few rand now for proper advice is, is not the worst thing to do. And you should view it as an insurance premium, um, really, in terms of your financial affairs. Uh, Gavin, maybe from your side, a final few words? Yeah, Johan, I think um, one of the things that you should be doing is understanding the arithmetic of what you're proposing to do. So withdrawing your lump sum from a retirement annuity, for example, costs you the, the tax on the lump sum. And that tax in the case of withdrawal reaches the 36% marginal rate much earlier than if you took the same lump sum out after retirement. So it's very important to, under, to get advice on what it is that you're planning to do and what the fiscal cost, what the literal cost of that is going to be when you do retire. So, for example, if you're over 55, um, you have two choices. You could retire or withdraw. If you retire and take a lump sum, you have a much lower tax rate on the lump sum than if you withdraw from that lump sum. So these are very important things to understand and to um, and to make sure that you understand and then implement them, not do them and then try and reverse out of them because it's nearly impossible. Yeah, thank you. I think you've just confirmed again, you know, the, the proper advice that one has to get and, and going the DIY route could cost you a lot of money in the end. Sarah, any final words from your side? So I think just really the, the more clients tend to hear and the more they the more facts they find out, the more confident they get. And you know, this session is really just to highlight awareness. And very often it's really hazardous for clients to try and base um, their knowledge on the information that they get from sessions like this. So just a word of caution, because you've understood three facts, those three facts may just be three facts against a background of 47 other facts that you may not know. So although this is highlighting awareness, please do not rely on this as being an all-exhaustive tax session and advice to you. Please ensure that you get advice that is applicable to you from the team or from your own yeah. tax specialist. Yeah, you know, it's it's a very complex and specialist area. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to move yourself physically and all your physical um, positions, but then you have to add on top of that all of these complexities. So it really, really would always be the best thing to invest in some, in some proper advice and doing some proper planning. But it sounds like that concludes our discussion for today then. Uh, I really hope that each and every one of you that attend this webinar have been able to gain greater insight around the topic of financial immigration and also the latest legislative developments that were shared during uh, the session today. We will keep on you know, focusing um, and, and, and following up in terms of further developments and we will hopefully then maybe see you again in another webinar. But I really want to, sh to thank Sarah, Andrew and Gavin for their time and for sharing their time, their knowledge and expertise with us today. Uh, thank you again for making the time to attend our discussion.